Welcome to another episode of the Snap No Tap Podcast, Tony Cicchini, Joe Cardinal, and we're flying by the seat of our pants today. Uh, I was supposed to be, it's 9 a.m. right now, I'm, I'm was supposed to be doing a seminar in Downers Grove today at 10 a.m., uh, and it got postponed until next week. So those people, I'm, I'm sure by the time everybody watches this, the time will, will have elapsed, but um, Apparently, the Krav guys had their big test last weekend, and they're still pretty banged up over it, and a couple of people are traveling. So to make it a more cohesive unit, they don't want to miss out on the training. So we're just going to postpone that till next Sunday, which would be uh, the 23rd of October, 10 a.m. to 12 noon. But yesterday, we had our first uh, of a continuing series of seminars at um, Fender Martial Art and Fitness. Joe was there. It was terrific. I got to meet a couple of, so quite a few new guys, uh, new people, um, and some old friends too. Joe Dankowski, his girlfriend, Becca, of course, Joe Cardinal, Jason Bender, um, and a um, couple of Serbian Greco-Roman guys. One of them, Alex, is uh, Jason Bender's Greco-Roman wrestling coach. They participated, and Bobby, who's a member, I think he said of the, didn't he say he's a member of the Serbian national team? Yeah, I think they're both high, like high level. They're like international level. stars, yeah, yeah, and they're down to earth, uh, really great. Um, and uh, a couple other guys too. Uh, you know me with with forgetfulness. I can't remember everybody's name, um, but. It was a nice turnout. I look forward to next month, month next month, uh, and just building. Uh, and uh, we've got to get the word out. So obviously, I don't know how many people watch the podcast or listen to the podcast. Um, and probably, I gather, the majority of the people aren't in the Chicagoland area, which is kind of strange. But that's just how it seems to always be. Uh, but we got to you know start spreading it out earlier. Before the seminar, Melody was there and she had to take off. But I told Melody, because I've been teaching in the Chicagoland area for longer than most people from the 90s, um, early 90s, like, I don't know, 94-ish, 95, mid-90s, however you want to word it, it doesn't matter. It's been a long time. Started in Stone Park, went to River Grove, went to Bensonville, <laughs> kind of deal. And for those of you who aren't from Chicago, let's just say geographically, each one of those towns is a little bit further away from the Chicago epicenter. And I, as, as I mentioned to Melody, I don't know how it is in other cities, but Chicago is weird in that people don't want to travel to train. Um, it's astonishing to me, and it's not a good thing because um, I have people coming from all over the world to train with me and I know other folks uh, who have made the, the trek either for martial arts or music in particular uh, hundreds if not thousands of miles to study but in Chicago the, it, it's just like they want everything so convenient um, they they you know we used to joke that hey you know they want me to make house calls um, so it's it's not surprising that you know that the people that are listening to the podcast uh, aren't from Chicago, aren't predominantly Chicagoans because now I'm not really based in the city. I'm 
even though technically I am, when you figure base vendors gym and crab gym and downers, but it, it's like the people from all over, you know, like I get emails from people saying, God, I wish I lived closer to you. You know, if I lived in Chicago, I'd be training with you all the time. So yeah, it's, it's a strange phenomenon. And I don't, I don't know if it's limited to Chicago or if other large metropolises, uh, go with that, but you cannot get catch wrestling training anywhere else. So like this, so that's what is, you know, it's not like a run of the mill ice cream shop. So I don't get that. Yeah, I don't know. Well, before we go dig into that, because I do want to circle back to that, but before I forget, because I keep forgetting, um, you mentioned Melody. I just want to congratulate her. So she's been on the show multiple times. You know, she's as a guest and then kind of as a contributing uh, uh, host, I guess. Uh, but she got her hostess, yeah. Um, but she got her brown belt a couple of weeks ago. So that's huge. Um, in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, yes. In Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, yeah. And um, yeah, because I remember when we were training at, um, the cheetah gym with Bender and Dankowski back when she was just a lowly blue belt. You know, remember that we'd come in and she'd be training with Jason doing her privates. And so it's, it's kind of cool to see her keep plugging away and growing and uh, getting the recognition for being at it, you know, for uh, you know, when, I, if you go back and listen to her episode, you know, it was not something that was like a, a real initial desire for her. She came to it, you know, and uh uh, found like community and a love of grappling. And so it's really exciting to see her, you know, now, now that she teaches, I think one night a week uh, at Bender school. Uh, but anyway, just, to, I want to make sure that we publicly congratulated her on that. That's a major accomplishment. Um, not a lot of people get to very few people make it to that level. Um, and also to another uh, guest who had been on the show and a friend of ours, uh, Blaine Beal, he, um, got gold in the uh, Nogi Pan Ams. I guess it's at the blue belt level. I'm not quite sure. I didn't look into the details. And a month prior to that, we didn't bring it up on the show, uh, but in the Gi, he got uh, gold for the IBJJ uh, national levels too at the blue belt level. So he's just nonstop winning. Um, and so obviously he's gonna go really far with that and it's got a lot to go, but congratulations to two, uh, two people who've been on this show and are friends of ours who have been doing really great in competition and getting promoted. So anyways, so I want to shout those out. Um, but kind of to your point, we were kind of talking about, I was wondering if there's like a parallel kind of almost with dating in an urban environment when you have a lot of options around. Um, you know, we were talking about this yesterday when you, you know, when you, you're kind of so isolated and far away that you notice that a lot of people are married, right? Like even young kids, like they probably, whoever their high school sweetheart is, they, it seems like they're probably married to them, but that's maybe there's not a lot of options. They don't see options out there. You know, everybody knows each other. And I just wonder if there's like a parallel with training where there's schools, you know, they've got Every neighborhood now has a jujitsu school. You know, it was like karate schools in the 50s or whatever. I mean, they've really taken over. Um, and, you know, that's more power to them. But I think a lot of people get their grappling fix, you know, like, hey, I can just, you know, travel 10, 15 minutes and get my workout in. I think that that is maybe as far as some people want to take it, you know. And so in some ways you've got more <coughs> people, but also um, – you know, I, I don't know. I think it's multiple things, but I think that's maybe part of it. So it's pros and cons, you know. Um, I think you obviously your your lineage and style of catch wrestling is unique to the world and the knowledge you have. But I don't know if a lot of people get that, you know. Uh, like we talk about a lot of techniques when, um, you know, if people take the time to study your videos and go through it, some light bulbs should go off that you're teaching something different, you know. And people who are, I think, who are experienced with grappling, they should see that. But I think that maybe, you know, when people are just starting out, well, not even just starting out, I guess, obviously, that wouldn't be what we're talking about here. But I don't know. I think there's a lot of factors working to that where, um, yeah, you know. Well, yeah, I think when we were talking to Blaine yesterday, yes, and let me just double down on congratulating Blaine and Melody, she's Melody's just one of the nicest people you've ever you can ever meet in your life. And with her getting her brown belt, you know, now it's like, and I asked her, I says, Well, are there different levels of brown belt? You know, because 
every school has it set up differently. You know, I know that in certain martial arts styles, there's like three or four levels of brown belt, you know, and it goes on and on. She says, nope, this is it. So the next one is black belt. And it can almost be anticlimactic at times, you know, when you're getting that much closer to your end goal. But like I mentioned, the word black belt means really in the scheme of life, nothing, you're still nothing because you're still going to learn. You're going to learn forever. Uh, but uh, congratulations to both of them. But like when I mentioned the Blaine or Blaine brought up to me, he's like, yeah, I've been hearing all, you know, these wrist locks or this or that. I said, look, what I teach is far more than just modified submissions or more technical submissions. It's the whole approach to fighting uh, of utilizing space and this and that. It's a lot more, the uh, it's more scientific and more technically oriented than just learning certain moves and learning them from, you know, patterns, you know, learning them from certain positions. It's a whole new, uh, it's a whole different mindset of fighting. So I think that that point gets lost uh, and, um, or not lost, just doesn't get understood. And a lot of it could be my, my fall of the videos, not really delving into it because it's, it's more of a lecture even than, you know, I think the part, the problem with martial arts, and it is a problem, is it it's so damn technique oriented to its detriment. And this is why so many martial artists aren't really truly good because they're focusing on technique and not putting it together, okay? Um, there's only so many techniques that are going to work. And yet there's thousands and thousands of techniques, it's overkill, all right? Um, and it's learning the application of it. How do you do it? How can I be more creative? Um, and I, I mean, at times I've tried to demonstrate it in videos. Um, back when I used to make videos all, all the time, pirating pretty much put the, put the kibosh on that. But it's it's something that needs to be, you have to be immersed in it. So yesterday, um, pretty much half or, or may, maybe more than half of the people there never were in, have never trained with me. And maybe they, they've only heard about me through word of mouth. But it was interesting, if you know this, Joe, when I put, when we did cover some submissions, when I put the submissions on them, their physical reactions were all like epic and these are grapplers these aren't like karate men or you know whatever or to totally uninitiated and that's what separates what i do from any other guy in in the martial arts world including other people that call themselves catch wrestlers they don't their their submissions aren't at that you know you just don't get that kind of reaction um, and you can't get that from watching a video. You know, you see it and you're like, well, that can't be, or it's, he's overreacting. No. Well, a couple of things, because kind of to your earlier point, I mean, as far as the overall approach, and that's one of the things that I'm always trying to get my mind around. And I think it's, it's a tough thing to transition to, but it's, it's more of like in terms, instead of, like you said, not just techniques, but it's also like, I don't know if the right term is tactics or strategy. You know, uh, I don't know if those are the right descriptions. Um, like for instance, and I want to dig into this a little bit further, maybe later in the conversation, but you know, most grappling, sport grappling or, you know, combat grappling, not combat, but anyways, whatever, sport fighting, or combat sport grappling things. They're, I wouldn't say they're designed, but there's definitely like, you know, most minimum, they have a minimum of five minute rounds, right? You know, um, which in a street fight is a really long time. And the impression I get, especially when like yeah, yesterday, you know, when I was, I was being the, uh, the dummy for you to drill on or to demonstrate on, I was not going to last. Like it was over with in seconds because of, how vulnerable I was, you know, once I had lost position, let's say you got around my legs or whatever, it took me down. Uh, if I had messed up to that point, 
you know, you were in very short order, even if you couldn't get an initial submission on me, you were going to be ripping on me or doing something, you know, like you're rapidly trying to bring this fight to an end. And, and I think obviously everybody's goal is to win their match as quickly as possible. So it's hard to describe, but I think because they take out all the, the really risky things or injurious or unsportsmanlike things, you know, like once you really take a strip away those rules, a lot of the, um, the time factors that it takes to, to uh, submit someone are gone. And I think that's kind of like a, it's like almost a, your brain gets programmed to think, oh, I'm going to have to fight for, you know, a few minutes here, you know, several minutes to get in my position and finally win. But in a street fight, and when you're grappling like that, whatever comes your way, if you're in a bad position or if you've messed up, you're yeah. going to really pay a bad, bad cost very quickly. And, um, and so the, yeah, I think it's almost like a different mental switch of like, I've got, and you, I think you talked about this, like you should almost drill like in like one minute or less matches where it's like, I've got to do something. I mean, part of it's tricky because at this point, some of the stuff you're doing can really hurt somebody, you know, like it's not, it's not easy <clears throat> to level. And I am curious, um, you know, I wanted to kind of pick your brain about when you were drilling with Radvan and, and training with him, you know, hey, I guess, let me take a step back. Um, so I think we talked about this often that, like you said, the first six months or so, you were just building conditioning, just building yourself up to have the endurance and strength to train. After that, you know, he began to show you some moves and some some holds, like the top wrist like was maybe the first thing he showed you. At what point, how much longer after that, when when would you guys actually start to go live? You know, well, we're almost from the get go, let, let's clarify a few things here because, you know, yeah, it was, let's call it six months. I don't remember exactly. It could have been four, you know, that's right. irrelevant. That's all bullshit. But during that period of time, he would still work on me. Okay. He was ripping on me and just this and that and testing. Okay. So for example, here, let's, let's spell this out for people. When you're lifting weights, which I did not do, we did not have access to weights. I wasn't lifting weights, but the correlation is this. When you're lifting weights, if let's just use the bench press for an example, and you're bench pressing 200 pounds, two reps. In the course of a month, now you're benching 200 pounds, four reps, whatever. You can gauge it, you're making progress. Well, with these kind of exercises, it's not, you don't have that built-in uh, there's no gauge on how you progress. These exercises were designed for one, to get me to develop the conditioning that I'll need to last so I can do the, the thousands of repetitions, but also to strengthen and toughen my body in ways that, you know, that you're going to have to find out, am I making progress? And that was by him locking me up and doing things and ripping and, you know, getting my body calloused and 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 my mind mentally prepared for all of it. So, um, so in that essence, we went live probably within the first couple of weeks. You know, um, just so you know, I I had an idea of what's going on, and it wasn't just mindless exercises. As far as um, learning the application of holds yeah that came a bit later you know a, a, a few months down the line but yeah it was a constant uh beating there's just no other way around it it wasn't permanent crippling things but it was um right from the get-go okay and i know that you want me to and you mentioned yesterday you want me to train these people as day one, like that I did, like from the very day one. It won't happen. Um, it would take a pilgrimage. It really would. It would take people that would want to come probably to my house and just say, look, here we are. Let's go. And, you know, give, give me nine, give me one year of, of that intensity. Uh, we're living in a different day and age. Uh, these people that would come to me now are not children. Their their bodies are older and already 
gone through uh, whatever it's gone through. Uh, they have jobs, they have families, and this stuff is not for the weak. So, you know, it it may not be a, it may not be practical. I, I'm not sure that there'll be anybody in the world that will be able to go through it. Not just even besides their willingness, just because of the necessity of life going on. So it's tough. But I can tell you this, uh, to, to go a little further into, it's not just the ripping, it's, and it's not just a strategy, because it's easy to say, well, get, all, get around his legs or circle to the head, this or that, but you can't just do it. You got to do it the right way. It would be like talking to a little baby and tell the baby, come here, walk over here, walk to me, come to me, walk to me. Now, hang a right, hang a left, and then walk straight. The baby doesn't know how to walk yet. The baby doesn't have that knowledge, that balance, all the, and that's the same thing here. It's, so it goes a little beyond strategy. You got to know how to move on the ground. If, if we're focusing, let's say, on ground techniques, there's a right way and a wrong way of moving on the ground. There's a right way and wrong way of he your hips. And should I elevate? Should I go lower? When do I elevate? When do I go lower? Do I drive with my balls on my feet? Do I stay on my arches? Do I stay on my insteps? Do I instep? Do I go? So it's more than just the strategy itself. You know, you to again, I have to relate back to music because it's so pertinent. When you have a master like Oscar Peterson or the late Joey D. Francesco, uh, they think so quickly and they're able to improvise and create. It's called um, inventions, right? Because they're inventing patterns and they're inventing runs on the spot that's, that, that have never been done before, right? Um, so you could you could say like when I had when I was talking to Joey D Francesco, what what do you do here? I mean, what are your thoughts? How are you moving the chords? Well, you got to know what the chords are. Number one, you got to know the fingering. You got to know are you playing th this chord with three notes, four notes, five notes, open harmony, closed harmony. So it's easy for Joey to say. Uh, you know, D minor seven, D flat 13th, you know, this or that, whatever. But first of all, the, 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 the person he's telling it to has got to know what those chords are, got to know the voicings. So there's a lot more to it. And um, that's hard, Joe, that that's, that's hard. And, and especially now when people are so immersed in the different styles of grappling, there's things that they're going to have to unlearn. Okay. Um, and, you know, that's just, that's, so it, it's, it's really not just as simple as saying, well, okay, well, let me talk to Tony on the telephone, you know, or on a Zoom, you know, and he can explain my strategy. No, you, you, you've got to work at learning how to walk all over again, so to speak. And some people just don't want to do that. Um, you know, they're so invested in the way they're doing it and they, and they're almost self-defeatist thinking, I can't learn it. I'd have to unlearn and then relearn. And yeah, they're right. You have to unlearn it and relearn it, but you can do it. It can be done. It's just a question of desire. So uh, it's a thinking man's, not, I mean, not that others aren't thinking, man. I don't want to sound it like that, but really you, you, you have to use your brain here and, and, and slow down and, and realize it's more than just brute, physicality okay there's there's subtleties here that go missed um and that and, and that most people can't pick up on a video you know well yeah and I, I think i often said that until you feel it you know you're especially but it's put on by you um you're not going to appreciate how bad it is <laughs> but i mean i remember seeing your videos initially and being impressed with with a few things technically and like just like I said strategically again I was like oh this makes a lot more sense to me just from some ways that I felt vulnerable from training in the past then it got I think you know like I think I went to a, at the old tool and die in Stone Park we, you did a seminar back there when you put the holds on 
that was one like the, the the real awakening was was like holy shit this is so much worse um and obviously there weren't things that weren't on the video that you were doing so um i think yeah everybody would benefit from getting in-person training and hands-on um that's what i always think like in these workshops and seminars that um like i think you demoed on a few of those guys so they got to feel it like you said they they got to react to it um and I think that'll, no pun intended, leave an impression. Um, yeah, and, and you're not injured, okay? You're in pain while the hole is applied, but I'm not there to crush it. You know, I'm not there to injure somebody. Um, but, you know, it. we talked, the, the lost art of hooking, that was the video release that really put catch wrestling on the map again. And here we are almost 25 years later. It'll be 20. It came out in 99, I believe. So next year will be 24 years. And it's still the lost art because people aren't learning the, the in-depthness of it. Um, and, and that's sad because it's still a lost art. Uh, even though it's exposed now, uh, and it has been for almost a quarter of a century. Very few people, you know, have wanted to dig in and and really learn the intricacies of it, because it's it's not easy. If it was easy, then everybody it would you know it, it would be able to be done. And so many people were misguided and misled, and they went down the wrong path, and they wasted years of their life. Um, and and. And others who are just anti-wrestling jump on that and they see these people and they're they're like, my God, look how terrible this is. They're no good. They're they're getting snuffed by jujitsu guys left and right, which is true. Because it's not just it's not the submissions that make the difference. Yes, the submissions are different. The way I teach it, forget about anybody else. They they teach it pretty much like everybody. But it's the whole thing tied in together that, and that's what people just don't seem to get. It's not just the ripping; it's that's missing. It's not. It's not just the the the, the real technical aspects of the submissions. It, it, it is the strategies in a way, but it's also how do you apply these strategies? That's the that's the thing that's missing in so many people. They just don't want to do it, um, and they don't have to do it. OK, we've been I've been to enough other schools to see how they how they grapple. And it's more happenstance or whatever the word is, you know, it scrambles all the time, whereas it's not so much moving. I see people not moving the right way. Um, but, you know, I, I see that in some stand up styles, too, if you would compare. I don't know, some off the path martial arts style, stand up only, striking, comparing it to the way a boxer moves or something, you or even a tie boxer, you'll you you'll see that man, it's like totally different. Um, not as effective. So that's so I look at it through that, okay, um, through that lens. And it gets frustrating for me. It it really does. Uh I'm not gonna sit there and lie to you. It it it's like I wasted my life trying to educate the people and open their eyes to this. And some people, you know, got it, you know, and, and wanted to develop it further. Unfortunately, distance or life circumstances, as is always the case, um, you know, enters into it. But uh, you know, I'm still plugging along as best I can. But boy, I I liked it better in the 80s, you know, when Nobody knew, and I had this knowledge that nobody had, and you know I, nobody cared, and you know it's just now it's just like you you seen the last thirty years you're just fighting all these different elements that you don't really need to, and the and the bottom line is nobody's making me worse, you know it's not like my skills oh I see this different style that's so much better that never existed I never saw it yet and I I don't expect to, but. It just bothers me now because I kind of got on that kick 30 years ago or 25 years ago, whatever, 
30 years ago of wanting to share my knowledge. Uh, and again, in hindsight, I should have just kept it to myself, you know, and, and went about my life, had a day job, and I could have been retired now sitting pretty and still have all the ability and knowledge that I ever did, you know, so I gambled. I shouldn't have. That's my take on it. Well, that's unfortunate that you feel that way about it. I mean, I don't. Oh, I think certainly so. do. I and I don't yeah. apologize for it. And it's not my fault because I did everything I could for these thirty years, even with my extraordinary life ex circumstances, health issues, or family issues and shit. And I still, I have always been available. I've never like gone underground, so to speak. I've always had the website. It's never gone away. I've always had ways of getting a hold of me. That's never gone away. I've always tried to still coach. You know, I mean, I had consistently until what, five years ago? I always had a gym. You know, I was either in Benson, uh, Stone Park or Triton College or Bensonville. You know, I never walked away. I was, I've always been there. And if people didn't know about it or just that, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I hate to sound this way, but straight out, it's not my fault. I've been there. My, my website's been there for forever. And, uh, you know, you Google search me. And now I'm getting up there. I'm almost 60 years old, you know, uh, and I've lost the desire many years ago because of what I'm, I'm just telling you now, but I keep going because of the few people like yourself or others like Jason Bender telling me how much he loves me and he's so thankful that I'm working out of his gym. That means a lot to me because I'm sentimental about this shit. Okay, so I can bitch and moan like most Italian guys. You know, we, we complain all the time. You know, this, that. And then like 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 uh, Corey said on the phone, but you, you won't hear me complaining, right? That's just how <laughs> we are. That's, that's how our nature is. We'll go bitch and moan and bitch and moan and bitch and moan. And then at the end of it, well, you won't hear me complaining. Well, that's <laughs> just how I am, right? I'll, I'll bitch and moan about this, but I still do it anyway. You know, I, I mean, I still continue on. Um, but I've been, honestly, let's flip it over on the flip side. I've met some, some wonderful people through the years. Now, this last two weeks, we've had a uh, an issue correspondence. I don't know if Russell Stutley's getting your emails or not, but we also got to get Terry Dow on because Terry's chomping at the bit. Um, these are just two guys out of many that 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 are a complete different walk of life as far as the martial arts world that that entered my life and will be in my life till the day I die. Just great martial artists. Uh, in their own way and in and, and experts at what they do and you know I love it Jason Bender well now now we're we're kind of close because of the uh the grappling but I've met strength at strength athletes or just other kind of people that you know that really aren't even martial artists that I've been blessed in a way very enriched they've enriched my life uh many are some have passed away unfortunately Kevin being one of them um, but, you know, so I may bitch and moan about the catch wrestling shit, but overall, I've met some world-class people. I've been, I've been lucky. Yeah, and I think you've influenced people all over the world. I, you know, I, uh, it, you know, whether or not they've completely understood your approach or been able to execute like you do. Um, you definitely, if anything, you know, uh, supplemented people's training and influenced them. You know, I mean, we have people, we've had, as you, meant, you mentioned, um, you know, Russell from Cambodia, who's influenced by your stuff. I've seen people in Singapore. There's some, you have some Tri-C members yes. from there, I believe. Yeah, students in um, England, right? All over. Yeah, all over. So, I mean, and, and you've spread... Like you said, whether or not you get 100% credit for it, the world knows about catch wrestling because of you. You know, you you re-erased, you know, people were calling it shooto or some, you know, like it, it 
it had lost its roots somehow, you know, going overseas to Japan and stuff. It, it kind of, and you tied it back in for everybody as to where, where this stuff was coming from. And, well, you know, um, let me interrupt before I forget, because my memory is short, but you know that I've been cleaning out my attic and I've, and I've gone through a lot of paperwork. I've thrown out business related stuff from years, 20 years ago or longer, whatever, just some shit can and everything. I got to get rid of stuff. But every so often through this cleaning that took hours and I'm still not done, I'd stop and I'd read something that somebody had written me back then, you know, it was a lot of mail correspondence. And yeah, they brought up about, wow, you know, you really showed us the difference between what the Japanese style, you know, that, that Shudo, that Carl Gott style and how, how you're more of a, you know, wrestling based and the submissions are different. So years and years ago, people did realize the difference. There were certain people out there that realized it. Okay. Because they were exposed to um, that style because it, that was kind of popular in in europe or asia maybe not so much anymore because it's all pretty much brazilian jiu-jitsu oriented now um so there were people that understood that and, and and you know got it but part of the issue and this goes for anybody who's interested in in doing this as a as a business which you've got to understand that the pretty much 99% of your students, none of them are going to be interested in opening up a business, doing that, doing whatever it is you're doing, okay, whatever style it is you're doing. They may be doing it for other reasons, and they're not going to be professional minded about it, okay? Um, like you, you know, you have no desire to open up a school. Most people don't. They just want to get better at what they're doing. So that's great. And that's how it should be. I never had any idea that I was ever going to open up a business doing this. It just, I fell into it. So that kind of hurts the spread of anything, not just what I teach, but could be anything because, you know, people, they don't want to get commercial. Um, and you had mentioned, you know, Brazilian jiu-jitsu uh, schools, you know, are a little more popular now. So now you're up against that um and and before that years before that it was like the taekwondo schools um and, and if you opened up a small non-taekwondo type of school let's say a chinese martial art or even a small japanese style school you're up against the conglomerate okay so it's always been hard this is nothing new and it's a niche market to begin with so that kind of hurts the popularity and i know that many years ago uh rival catch schools were opening up these satellite schools which i to this day i'm, I'm very opposed not satellite schools but like clubs and i'm opposed to that i've always been opposed to that and i'll, I'll die being opposed to that because you can't just randomly you, you, you have to be trained and you have to practice under strict guidelines you have to have someone like at my level overseeing that constantly not once a year not once a month. Really, it should be every workout. Because if you're doing something wrong, you're not good enough as the student to know that you're doing it wrong. You may be able to get some success against whoever else is in your class because you're all like-minded and you're all like beginners. And, you know, when you venture out outside and you start to get snuffed, Wow. Okay. That's just like horrible. So that hurt me from a business standpoint because everybody just wanted to, at the time, wanted to open up their own little satellite schools or whatever the term is. And I just wasn't going to do it. I said, no chance with me. You have to be monitored. Uh, and I'm proud of myself for doing that because so many people in any walk of life that are self-taught or they, they try to learn like that, you're never gonna you're never gonna climb that mountain of greatness, okay? You just aren't gonna do it. Uh, and I know this. No one is going to tell me or show me anecdotal evidence. It's all bullshit because I have trained thousands of people through the years, thousands, who have told me that they're trained under blah blah blah, Joe Blow from wherever, and they go to see that person at a seminar. 
once or twice a year. And I can just tell they're not good at what Joe Blow is teaching. Okay. Joe Blow may be a very skilled instructor. You're not grasping it. It's not Joe Blow's fault because Joe, you only see Joe Blow once or twice a year. So now you're teaching, quote unquote, what Joe Blow's teaching, and it sucks. And the only reason Joe Blow doesn't like get demolished business wise is because Joe Blow has thousands of these types of students. All right. So now you got a big group, a, a core of, of thousands of people who train under Joe Blow once or twice a year. So you have that support group. I don't have that because. I don't operate that way, all right? If you're going to train under me, you're going to be the toughest man that ever lived, okay? You're going to be as good as anybody on planet Earth or go away. I'm not going to just like, you know, boom. And some people just can't do that. Even with the Tri-C program, some people just get, oh, man, they, they kind of want to spread their wings. No, you've got to follow along. You've got to do this ugly grunt work in order to become elite, you're not going to get good if you're always practicing chokeholds or a toehold. There's so much more to it than that. That's like eating your dessert and nothing else. Where's your nutrients? Where's your protein? Well, the sit-outs, the hip hikes, the pinning, the riding, this, that, the movement, that's all your protein. That's your nutrients in fighting. And that's the shit that people don't seem to want to do. Many people, not all, you know, but many, I'll say that most. So that's what irks me, but that's what really crushed me because I just wouldn't allow that. And it, it, it and it's and it's better for those people that wanted that, that weren't willing to put in the time and effort to say, okay, I'm going to train under Tony diligently, like all the time. And I'm going to not make, a, I'm not going to blow my nose unless he's telling me I'm doing it correctly. And nowadays, uh, it's so much easier to do this because we can do the Zoom or you can just upload a video. You don't have to mail it to me like the old guys used to have to do. Um, but again, it's time consuming for me. I can only take in a, a certain amount. And, and it obviously you have to pay me for this. I, you know, it would, it would be costly to do now because of time. But um, yeah, I think that's where, that's where it all went south because I wasn't going to sell out. You couldn't buy me, in essence. You, you, you still can't. You have to work hard to make that progress. There was a guy, I'm not mentioning names here, because I don't even know if this person is living or dead, but he was legit, apparently in, in his martial arts style, but he was selling black belts, okay? And I know this because people I was training were, you know, they, they were used to be affiliated with it, you know, with him until, you know, it just got ridiculous. Um, and, and, and that, and that, and that, and that, and that, that can happen, you know, um, conversely, there's other people, we know somebody who was being held back by their instructor and people, and some instructors do that for, uh, what do you call it? Um, training, uh, competition purposes, sandbaggers. OK, but that's not really a sandbag. A sandbagger in like in the world of pool is someone who knows that they're absolutely crushing. OK, and they per they personally purposely hold themselves back. So in this instance, when a, when when you've got all the level skill level in the world to like, let's say you're crushing black belts. Which happens more often than people want to acknowledge, but yet you're a white belt or a blue belt. You know, it, that just irks me. And, you know, um, one of our dear friends, you know, this a couple of years before the, well, before the COVID, however long that was three years ago, two years ago, he was being held back. You know that. And I told him then I said, you know, this is bullshit. You know, you can pretty much go toe to toe with your instructor and you're, you're a blue belt. You know, you're the same rank as your girlfriend. Hey, 
Come on here. So there's there's politics to it. I get it. I that's why I don't affiliate with anybody. You know, and that's another thing that probably hurt me in the past because I wouldn't affiliate. I'm on my own, man. Just I don't want to be part of your bullshit, your politics. So they trash me, they bash me. That's fine. Go for it. You were you're you're gonna bash me no matter what. That's you, but you're proving my point. You're you're it's exactly why I wouldn't want to be affiliated with you because all you guys do is 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 just you know mess with people as opposed to training and getting better. So I I don't know. I don't see that in the music world. Um I mean, I'm not saying it doesn't exist, and yet to a degree, it probably like a small degree, it kind of does. But you know, musicians generally try to help each other. You know, um, we, they all know these like they know what it took to get elite. I think the crappy musicians. I played with a lot of shitty musicians, so they may be a little more apt to do that. But your better musicians, they're willing to help. Um, but yeah, it, there's there's so there's a lot to it. I've discussed this in the past about people when they're they're talking about opening up a school. There's there's a lot to it. One guy, like, emailed me. I don't know how long ago now. A couple months. Never responded back after I responded to him. But he was like wanting to open up a school, and you know, I don't know to this day if he if if he was like implying that he wanted to train me or just train under me or or just wanted some sort of random endorsement out of the blue. Uh, but he was saying, I, I can't afford your seminars. And I'm thinking, well, you can't afford a school. Uh, how much is a seminar? Nothing. You know, it's probably next to him. It's pennies um, compared to even my Tri-C program is nothing. Okay. If you're talking about opening up a school, you have, and you know, and you're that tight on money, you, you don't, you, you, you don't open up a school. Because there's a lot of expenses involved in it, um, equipment, um, you know, utilities, advertising, blah blah blah. You have to budget for all of this. So yeah, it, it's there was a lot of factors working against it, and so be it, man. There's nothing you can do about it. But I never sold out, so I kept my integrity, and. Not everybody can say that, that they, that they, you know, not everybody can say they never sold out. I definitely sold out, but you know, that's another story. Well, with your looks. Yeah. Um, so I do want to mention something else that I really wanted to start the podcast off, but we still got a ways to go, but let me throw this in there. So yesterday, uh, when I came home and just chilled out, really finding out that I didn't have to coach today. Um, and anyway, I s laid down and uh, had the Cleveland Indians ball game on, the Guardians playing the Yankees. And I'm watching, the Indians are up two to nothing. And then the Yankees tied it two to two. And I know I dozed off. I woke back up, Yankees are winning four to two. And I just could not for the life of me stay awake. And it was like the sixth inning, I think, or maybe the seventh inning. I don't remember now. Seventh inning, maybe. And I just fell asleep. Passed out. <laughs> this morning, I wake up early. I check the score. The Indians scored three runs in the bottom of the ninth to win the game. They're up two games to one now in this best of five series. Wow. So the Indians can wrap it up tonight. So I And they're playing at home again at, at, at Cleveland. So the so I'm going to watch, I'm going to make sure I'm, you know, I'm going to do the attic and get all that out of the way and then watch the Indian, uh, the guardians and, um, and pull for them to get into the championship series. Um, so, yeah. Uh, but you know, but for a lot of people that want to train, they got to understand that their coach, regardless of who that coach is, it's still a business. Okay. For the coach. And while you, you, you would love for your coach to say, okay, it's a free lesson here or there, you know, most people aren't in a position to do that. Okay. I mean, unless they're either independently wealthy or they, they have a job, a day job that makes enough money where they can pay the bills and gives them enough free time to do it. 
Okay. Um, but the vast majority of people can't, they're not in that position. So it's, and it's, it's hard on the instructor, maybe sometimes not so much even physical, but mental because you, you become attached to the students and, you know, you want to see these people excel. <clears throat> so you end up pouring your heart into it. Or conversely, if, 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 if it's the other way where you, you really never, you never really get that attachment and then the instructor kind of will lose interest. So it's, it's difficult. So like if, that's why sometimes it's easier, you mentioned for, for students just to go to their, you know, corner jujitsu school because it's convenient for them and it's an established business. And, you know, as long as you support that school, it'll, it'll stay there, it'll be there. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean you're not going to get great training. You, you very well may be. So, it, but, but the fact that the matter is, it's a business. You, you got to pay and you got to support your instructor in, in other ways. And uh, so, yeah, don't forget that. And it, it's still a business, you know, and the instructor may cut you a break here or there, but it's still a business. They got to run. They got to keep their, their, their lights on. And I think sometimes we lose we lose track of that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and uh, I've made this observation before here, but kind of to your point of selling out, and like if you're deciding to be a business, they have to def definitely keep their doors open and and do things like kids classes. And I mean, it's a tough business to succeed at, you know. Um, so you're you're as far as having that core hard crew, hardcore group of people who really train, um, you know, I'm sure it's, it's gotta be a mix for the instructor where, you know, they've just gotta, they know that a certain percentage of people are only gonna be there for a short time and then take off. You know, there's just all oh, this natural attrition that you don't see those people, but then there's the people who are gonna stick with you, you know, and show up three times a week or more, you know, the, the real dedicated. And I think it's a very lucky- uh, <clears throat> Yeah where they, they get a lot of those kind of people. I am, I'm, I think um, this is where you can sustain a business. I think that's got to be really tough because like you said, life gets in the way for some people, for most people, especially adults who are, are doing this later in life. Uh, it's very hard to make this their top priority, you know? And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely, I don't envy any of those instructors. I'm sure it's got to be a real struggle, you know, to keep those places open. Yeah, and I like I said, I always demanded that you 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 give it your best, um, and you know, um, I'm not, again, I'm not saying that all instructors across the country or world don't demand the best, but yeah, like you say, there's a lot of workout facilities that are more socially oriented. Okay, as long as you're sweating, it's all good. But with me, you know, I felt an obligation to, to teach, to spread my knowledge. Um, and I didn't want it bastardized or I didn't want it misinterpreted. You know, I wanted you to get the full angst of it. And, uh, and, and since I was the guy, uh, there, there, there was an added, um, sense of uh responsibility on my part you know and then getting re uh what's the word with lou thez lou you're lou saying tony you're the only one you're the last this is it this is the real deal oh my god so that you know this was like you know after rodvan's death just more impetus to you know keep it going uh the right way don't sell out you know, um, so yeah, it was like an added responsibility. Okay. And because it was just me, you could have phonies opening up schools and this has happened forever. I, I'm not the only person that this has happened to. It was hugely popular in the 1970s where phonies were opening up Kung Fu schools and and it seemed Kung Fu was the big thing then, you know, with the Bruce Lee stuff and, and all of that. 
Um, and so it's, it's, it's not a new phenomenon. Okay. Um, and you can't police the world. There was nothing I could do. You know, what, what am I, what am I supposed to do? Um, so yeah, there was a lot of things that worked against me or just real catch wrestling in general. And, um, you know, even wonderful martial artists like, like take Eric Paulson, what he does is completely different than mine. Okay. And he's not a purist. I mean, he's not a catch wrestler, right? He does Brazilian jiu-jitsu. He does shooto, uh, or, you know, uh, his, what he calls combat wrestling. It's a blend and it's, it's a whole different, you know, it's different. It's, it's not what I do. Um, and I'm sure there's others that I I can't think of right now. You know, uh, 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 come on, he's been in the UFC and all over the place. Uh, oh, out of Washington, Barnett. Barnett. I cannot. You know me with my names. Yeah, Josh doesn't do what I do. You know, Josh is 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 it comes from a, a difference. You can watch the way he moves is different. There's similarities, obviously, because it's human beings, but it's different. Um. Different to the point of, I mean, it's just completely different. Spanish and Italian, okay? The language, it's it's like that. Um, and Josh is highly successful in, in, in what he does. And what the way I move and the way I teach and the way I apply moves and submissions are, again, totally different. So um, there is just, you know, but when you watch some, let's say, People with the last name Gracie, any of them. There's so many like older. Uh, they 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 were the same. Okay, the differences were in their personality. Okay, but their techniques, their moves, their applications were the same. That's not the case with me. Okay, it's you know my applications. It's not. It's more than just my personality that makes me look different. It's my whole style is different. Um, and that's simply because guys like Jason and Eric, uh, Josh Barnett and, and uh, Eric Paulson, great martial artists, great athletes, they didn't they they trained off my videos because they told me so, and they publicly mentioned it, but they didn't train under me personally under my tutelage for years. If they did, then they would be wrestling like I do, or or when they want to, they'd be able to replicate it. Um, so this is not a shot. This would be just like I don't wrestle their way. Because I never studied under their instructors and 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 took it in that direction. I took it in a different direction. Um, and again, this this gets lost with people. Uh, I know that I feel, and I'll die knowing that I learned from the very best that ever lived. Okay, I don't think there's any. And then I added my own uniqueness to it and so on there was no reason on earth for me to go and learn another grappling style i keep my eyes and ears open i watch like what lou luthez said once when he would wrestle overseas now granted these works but he would see a move uh that had potential okay a wrestler would do something and lou would be okay I'm going to go back home. I'm going to work on that. See what I can develop this into. Okay. You do that. Okay. That's something that you should never close your mind to. Okay. But to have to immerse myself in something else would be a detriment and it would be a waste of my time unless I wanted to get that belt ranking, let's say in a different style, which I didn't want to. Um, because for me, it's all about self-defense and I think I have the basis covered. Okay. I believe that I, when I was in my peak, I was as good as I could get. Okay. Um, and style didn't hold me back. The only thing that could possibly hold me back would be myself. Okay. And I, I think this is a philosophy that a lot of people have to understand that sometimes you're, you're always looking with like beyond as opposed to looking within. Okay. And because of the internet, especially, with the plethora of millions of different techniques out there, people keep looking beyond, looking for that one little special technique that's going to elevate them and make them, you know, the deadliest man 
alive. That's never, that's never going to happen. Okay. You got to look within. You've got to make yourself better, stronger, faster. Um, you've got to learn how to move properly. Like I said yesterday at the seminar, even at my age, people think I move so fast. It's not that I move fast. It's just that I'm always in the right position. I don't have to move far. Okay. I mean, I'm just going boom like that. All right. I'm so close that it looks quick. It may be quick because I'm not moving far because I'm always in the perfect position or I try to be in the perfect position to make that next move. That's not a technique. Okay. That's, that's just the foundation, the fundamentals. And, and, and that's on me to do. Okay. And, and I think that's what most martial artists need to learn. Not more techniques. You don't need that many, damn it. It's becoming perfect in your posture and in your movement and in your thought processes. That's the trick. That's the that's the secret. Okay. And it is a secret because people don't, well, maybe not now because I mentioned it, but people don't think that way. You know, that or they'll get lost in doing strongman exercises or bench, you know, all this getting so super strong. That's not it either. Yes, getting stronger is important. Getting flexibility, getting endurance, that's that's your physicality. But it's still putting it all together. And we saw yesterday highly skilled grapplers still doing basic mistakes, flaring out or, or shit like that. Um, it's a, it's 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 about getting 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 rid of all of that. Okay, tightening up your game. So you don't have a lot of wasted motion and you're not moving further than you have to. And um, and sometimes it's hard for me, especially now, it's harder for me to convey these thoughts. Um, like if I held a weekend camp, I'd have to have you here with me the, the night and day, spend the night for the weekend or whatever. And 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 we can go through it with with the with the participants. Um on how to change your thoughts and, and how to change your movement and your body alignment as opposed to learning these techniques because, you know, it's so many people know all these techniques, but they fail in the application. And then they blame the technique maybe, or they, they give kudos to their opponent when in reality your opponent didn't block the move the move didn't fail you did you didn't apply it the right way you you just you broke down along the way that's hard because now you're dealing with with muscle memory here and you got to you know you got to just that's the secret and that's where people fail. And even me admitting it now and telling people what you have to do, they, they won't know how to do it. They won't have the guidance to do it. <clears throat> you understand where I'm coming from? Well, yeah. I mean, as someone, I think obviously that's where I, I think I have the most to develop. And that's a big hole in my game. You know, I mean, I, just because I've seen the top wrist lock and the double wrist lock doesn't mean I can get it on somebody. So I definitely see that something that I need to work on myself you know getting in the right position and moving well so i mean uh it rings very true that that is something and i think that's got to be tough for a coach to convey too that's the you know uh, you know showing the technique is the this easy part i would think showing the submission let's say um but getting all those those right movements and and the, and the body weight and the control that's that just takes time well, listen, imagine you being a, a baseball coach, baseball, American baseball, and every batter that comes up to bat that you're coaching, you have to teach that batter how to walk, just how to physically walk to the batter's box. That's what I have to deal with sometimes here because people don't know how to quote unquote walk on, on the mat, okay? So you bring up the top wrist lock, there's more to it than just where your arms are. Where's your head? Where's your hips? Where's your knees? Where's your legs? How wide? How far apart? Are you on your toes? Are you this or that? It's the whole thing. You've got to teach everybody how to walk. And it's frustrating, first of all, as for a coach, 
um, because in this, it was easier for Radvan because he knew that with me, I, there was no distraction. I, did, I, I couldn't just say, well, the hell with this. I'm just going to go look it up on the internet. I'll, I'll, I'll go to Joe Blow and watch how he does it and, and still not learn it. So he had a captive audience, okay? We don't have that as coaches anymore. We don't have that luxury of a captive audience, okay? We're dealing with people who you've got to keep their attention at all times, and that's not always uh, easy to do, okay? That could be very difficult. But so many times, it's about teaching them how to walk all over again. And it's these sometimes non-tangible assets that you have to develop you know it, it's easier for me to say you're doing you're able to do 20 push-ups work it till you can do 25 that's tangible they can see the progress this stuff they can't see they don't realize the progress until they're snuffing people they're tapping people out now and they can't relate well what did it what is it that i did well now you're starting to unite your body everything's Everything's working the way it's supposed to work, which is a good thing. So this is why I say that people can learn all these techniques and keep training with whomever, blah, blah, blah. It really isn't going to become a threat. These guys aren't going to become like gigantically talented because they're missing out on the on this stuff that we're talking about, the non-tangible stuff, the, the body mechanics and and all of this. They're going to ultimately, it, it's, a, it's not going to, they're, they're, they're not going to become legendary elite legitimately, okay, um, un, unless they tighten up that stuff. And, you know, when you look at old boxers, you know, the 50s through the 70s, let's say, man, these guys were tight, okay? They knew what they were doing. They moved well. Their hands were always in the right position. Their head was in the right position, their feet, their placement. They were, it was poetry in motion. Um, you see that in track, track and field, let's say sprinting. You know, you can see the elite sprinters. They're like a racehorse. They're poetry in motion. And you can conversely see when they break down. When something, not like injured, but when they didn't run perfectly, you'll see, oh, their elbows went out or something went wrong. Um, it's easy to see, but in this world, it's, it's hard because even the most elite coaches are missing out on, on these, um, these, these, not every elite coach, don't get me wrong, but I'm just, just generally, they're missing out on these points that I'm trying to make because they're not even aware of it because they didn't learn that way because the sport's so damn new to them and, and, and from their, their, the pool, the pool that they draw from, uh, that's what makes it, you know, that's what makes it difficult. Look at boxing. Look at like the 1890s. They would get destroyed. They would get crushed by park district fighters nowadays. If you could transplant what the fighters nowadays, boxers, and put them back in that day and age, there it wouldn't even be a competitive match. Okay. It would not be. Um, but yet there was champions in the 1800s, 18, let's say 1890s, because they rose, because everybody was at their same level, okay? They all made the same errors. They all fought like in the same uh, style that wasn't as perfect as it could be. But through the decades, <coughs> um, they started to <clears throat> get better and better and better. To the point where it became, wow, what a, what a difference. Um, and that's what we're dealing with here. It's the same thing. I just happen to have been shown. I come from a different background where I was able, I was able to put it all together. Plus, I was shown things. But all the gaps, I was able to fill in the gaps. A lot of people can't fill in the gaps. So I can watch somebody. And you may be, I'll use you. You may be looking for that chokehold, that toehold that top wrist lock or whatever that they do, I'm looking at other things. I don't care about that submission. I'm looking at other things. Space, angle, uh, balance, 
you know, the, the intangibles. That's the difference. And that you cannot convey in a video. I want to go back to something you mentioned about personality. Um, to me, and I don't know if you agree with this, but do you think that that definitely makes a, a, a difference in fighting? So you have two guys with the same technical background, but if one <clears throat> has the more aggressive or angry approach, uh, that they will be more successful, especially in like a life or death situation, uh, someone who's willing to be uh, willing to hurt someone. I mean, do you see that that's, there's a psychological aspect of it? Um, and is that something that was conveyed to you, either indirectly or explicitly? Well, I can't get into specifics, but yes, I believe the personality really makes a difference. For me, it was my life that I was immersed in. So it was a uniqueness. And yeah, it was also referred constantly, like, you know, you're going to die, you're going to die, you're going to die on the street, on the street, on the street. Your worst training, your worst beating will be here with me. Well, that's how my coach kept. But I already knew that going in because I was a victim of a violent, of many violent crimes. My family, my neighbors, I've seen it all. So it, I don't know if it created anger with me. It created a sense of fear and sense of anxiety. That's a better word, anxiety. You're always, um, nervous and apprehensive and that's lasted to this day you know i'm always it's rare that you'll ever see me completely relaxed okay um because i'm not i'm always hyper alert so i do believe <clears throat> yes personality does enter into it and personality can change you can you can you can't change somebody's personality but you can i think you can change you can expose them to things and then let's see if they change their own personality, okay? Um, I think naivety uh, is a factor. People don't realize how bad it can get. Emotional detachment. They may read something on the internet. They may see something on the nightly news. But they're not directly affected. It's in their memory bank, but they're not affected directly. I think when it happens directly, that's where it can make a lasting impression. And it may have, it may have to happen more than once, you know, unfortunately. And in my case, it happened with alarming regularity. You've been to my neighborhood. You know what it's like. You've even talked to people who knew about my, my hood and how rough it was. So, and other people nowadays, they're still there. They live in those environments. You hear about it, you read about it, or hear it on, on the nightly, nightly news. And even when I was in Chicago, living in Chicago on the Northwest side, they weren't exposed to that stuff. They saw it on the nightly news. Okay, I lived it. So they would, my friends, the old timers would ask me about it. How'd you get by with, how'd you survive this shit? How'd you cope? How'd you deal with it? You know, because even though, because they didn't, they didn't, they never, they never dealt with it directly. So yeah, there's a difference between you can, you, you can try to manifest it in someone, but I've, I've mentioned this before, the best way, if you're really serious about learning self-defense, you've got to, you got to put yourself in a bad area more than once. You know, I mean, you've got to really live it. You know, driving through the bad neighborhoods isn't going to cut it. Because you know at the end of the night you're going home to tranquility. Try living in, the, in those areas. Th then you'll understand. There's no substitute for that. There really isn't. That's urban combat. There's no substitute. There's mock. You know, you can, like, I can expose you. I could take you, like, when we went to Cleveland... You wanted to get out of the car and take some pictures in a shitty neighborhood. I'm like, well, I'm getting out with you. Okay, just to stand there next to you, just to make sure. So you kind of saw, but you didn't see it, see it. You had your chance to see it when we were at the in the motel room and I was down in the lobby and that asshole tried to start some shit, but you were you were you were still upstairs coming down in the elevator. 
you missed it. You just saw me and the woman at work there discussing it afterwards and shit. You missed it. <laughs> but but that's the point. It can happen in a flash. It can happen just like that in a flash. So, yeah, it's a whole different. But, yeah, their personality makes a difference, in my opinion. It does. There are just people who will fold under pressure. They could be the most skilled gym rat in the world. But when push comes to shove, they'll fold. And that, that's been proven many times. And there's your hardcore gym rats, the tough guys. The legit tough guys that have a history of proving their toughness. That one day they just hit that wall and they're like, I can't go no more. I'm too old or I'm just, I'm too tired. I'm done. So you have that too. Um, it's, you know, who everybody's different, man. But you look at Buddy Rich when he played the drums, man, he was so ferocious. He looked like he was beating the living shit out of those drums. He had this anger and this whatever that came out in his playing. He was a very aggressive player. And even nowadays when I see guys that try to emulate him, and they come really close. They don't have that anger. They don't have that ferocity. They just don't have those kind of dynamics. They don't. Because they weren't raised like Buddy Rich. They didn't play and go through the ranks. Buddy started playing when he was two years old on stage. Traps the drum wonder. So he went through vaudeville and all of that all the way up. These guys that emulate him didn't have to go through any of that. They just saw Buddy slowed it down, figured out what he's doing, you know, with the fingers and everything, blah, 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 doing the crossovers it, it, like this. We can all learn to do that, okay? We have the technique to, or the, the technology to aid us in doing that. But there's that other aspect of it. In Buddies, it was his aggression, his dynamics, and his unmatched technique. Uh, you know, there may be some drummers that were equal. I, I've never heard them, I, I, you know. I'm not saying they didn't exist because it, it's tough to get a recording contract. Uh, so there may be, there may have been guys out there that were really, really good. Art Verdi was a very good fast drummer and all of that. But again, didn't have the dynamics of, of a buddy rich. Um, there's this other guy. Uh, uh, I think he's out of Florida now. Again, I, I, I'm not, I can't remember his name. Um, Don or Dan, Don something. Um, very, like a Buddy Rich clone, right? Just is missing that, the dynamics. So the anger. That's interesting that you bring that up. I'm glad you did because, yeah, that's my take on it. Yeah, I think personality has a lot to do with it. Yeah, I, I definitely think that's a thing for sure. And it's something I struggle with. It's something I try to be, well, it's tough too. Um, and the other, another related question or and I don't know if you agree with me on this point of it but when you're would you say it's helpful or you know because I think a lot about like the personality of Rodman and all the shit he went through World War II the prison camps he had a tough life you know like he probably had some personal demons and did you get the impression that uh, this sounds like it's almost like like saying something a criticism, but it's not as far I guess as far as a fighter for him or otherwise, at a certain point you've got to either almost want to hurt the person, like want or and or even to the point of enjoying it. Like I want to hurt like because I think sometimes in self-defense situations, at least mentally, it's kind of like, well, I want to protect myself. So it's more of a defensive, I want to be safe, I want to survive, I want to protect myself. But do you think there's an advantage to saying, especially when I think about like your approach with the ripping and the attacking and making the fight, the ending it quickly, and ultimately you end up getting the same results or maybe better, but it's like, no, I want to hurt you. You know, I think I've even heard you sometimes say, I'm going to get a souvenir. You know, you use that term and that that's to your advantage that if you can get that kind of, I don't know base or animalistic and again it's not a criticism 
because in some ways you know, we're all animals, right? When, it, when a fight is a fight, it doesn't matter. You're, you're fighting for your life. But when it comes down to it, it's like, you know, you've put me in this situation. I'm going to make you pay for it. Do you think, A, is that even not consciously, maybe subconsciously, that was something he or you, that's the frame of mind you get into to do, to do what you have to do? And is that a good thing? So I, there's a couple of questions in there, but. For me, absolutely. I've said it before. I'm capable of killing anybody on earth with my bare hands. I know it. I've known it for 40 years. Um, I, and yeah, I, I feel that if you, if, look, if this is just a minor disagreement between you and I or somebody like that, okay, I'll tone it down. But if it's a violent encounter, I'm not only protecting myself i'm doing society a favor by taking you out um and, or at least teaching you a lesson okay um that you'll that you won't forget and perhaps it will be a deterrent i know there's pacifists out there or there's people that are on the fence about it um it's very easy to say that when it hasn't happened to you when you're up against hardcore people that want nothing more than to destruct you okay uh, in many different ways, they, you know, they, there's rapists out there, there's cannibals out there, we know this, there's robbers that don't care about your financial situation, they want to take every penny you have, okay, um, and not just the money that's on you, thanks to the ATMs, they'll, they'll kidnap you or, you know, grab you and let's go to the ATM and clear that out for whatever they can get. Um, these are people that just, just don't care. Um, and then when they're done with you, they may go on to somebody else that same night. Okay. I mean, uh, yeah, my whole emphasis was always about hurting this person as much as, as possible, um, without getting hung up in it, you know, uh, where it becomes, where you're so entangled that now you're putting yourself at risk. So I don't apologize for that. Okay. Um, this is not a game with me. This is not a tournament. All right. You challenge me, you're taking your life into your own hands. And, and my whole goal is to kill you. I've said this before. This is nothing new. Okay. You're a, you don't know what my conditioning is right now, you, don't, you know, or anybody, right? It will use me as an example. I could be a 75 year old person that, that may have a fatal heart attack, or you may hit me or push me and I fall and I hit my head and I'm dead. That just happened recently on the news. Um, so these are life or death encounters. And I've told people this, and I even mentioned it yesterday. You've got to assume that the person you're going up against in the street is the deadliest, most dangerous man that ever lived, okay? Because yes, you every encounter is a life and death encounter. They don't need to pull a gun or a knife. They don't have to do that, okay? You don't know what this person's capable of doing, man. So yes, you have to look at this as a death match. If you don't, you're putting yourself at a, horrible um disadvantage so i know that going in and there's been times when i've been out with my buddies and they're like some shit starting and i'll just talk because i know if i get escalated it's going to get ugly for that person it's going to get bad and martin's talked about it a few times when he's seen me in in a street scenario or and shit um and i fight myself to 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 hold back, okay, to not just let loose. Um, and to a degree, I think we all do that. Even untrained people, there's, there's, with your voice, with your verbal, there's people who are verbally abusive, will say anything. Um, I've ended up having to channel a lot of that into verbal because I can physically do so much damage. I've got to do it verbally. I've got to deflect. Um, and, and many times in a street scenario, that, that's effective. That's enough. Um, but the difference is I can back it up if the verbal isn't good enough. A lot of people can't back it up. They bank, they bank just on verbal. Uh, the other thing on this 
is these people who try to teach you the psychology of self-defense. By the way, I never considered what I did self-defense. Matter of fact, I used to advertise self-offense. I'm very offensive-oriented. I'm not going to wait unless, it, you know, if somebody sucker punches me, okay, now it, it happened. But generally, I'm going to I'm going to go into action. But anyway, uh, to change to 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 help somebody psychologically is a very deep and time consuming process. Okay, it's not something that's going to happen instantaneously. The best, quickest self defense trick that you could do psychologically is cognitive dissonance. Okay, and so, for example, I mean, every situation would be different, but let's just say you're a trained mugger, you're a robber, that's what you do. You pull a gun on somebody, put your hands up, you know, and they react that way. They'll, they'll put their hands up. This is normally what they expect. I'm exaggerating here. So I'm just trying to make an example. Cognitive dissonance would be like, you know, flipping the guy off, grabbing the gun and attacking him, or not even getting him to that point, but just not cooperating. In an aggressive way, something that would shock the person, right? Now they're they they're they're trying to process this. Wait a minute, this isn't what I expected. But again, you can't just rely on these are tricks. You you you've got to have the backup to do it. You 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 know because you can't expect this crazed person who may be on mind altering drugs to react textbook psychology. All right. So all of these little tidbits are great to have. But you, you gotta still have to. You still have to have the physical ability to back it up. Do you? You know that's who knows. Um, everybody's different. But I can tell you this: anybody who relies strictly on grappling only, ground fighting only, let's put it that way, you're you're in trouble. You're in a lot of trouble. Okay, um, you can't be that <coughs> um, narrow-minded. Just like they used to say when. Oh, you can't just be a striker. You got to know grappling. You can't be so narrow-minded just to know striking. You got to be balanced, but you know, but you've got to be able to push that button when you can. You got to be able to hit that home run. Some people just cannot do it. So that's my take on it. And it always has been. But you know, yeah, once it's the fight's on, it's all on with me. Hello? Yeah, I'm just processing it, thinking, because, I mean, that kind of answers my question. Um, we've been going about 90 minutes. Do you want to keep going? Do you want to wrap well, things let's, up? Well, if you have one closing thing, let's, let's hit it, and then, um, and then we'll wrap it up. But, you know, the, 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 the whole point is, even in competition, there's, there's ferociousness. Okay, Dick, Dick Butkus or, you know, uh, Bob Gibson in baseball. I, I can't off the top of my head, come up with examples, but they're there of, of ferociousness that they, they, they would sometimes go within or with over the rules. They'd bend the rules or outright break them. Okay. Conrad Dobler, who played in the NFL, was known for a while as the dirtiest football player in the NFL. Okay. I guess Alex Karras, who became an actor, Webster and shit. Uh, he was another one who uh, would, would do things, uh, you know, and on and on, you know, there's just, so there are just people like that, okay? But then you have your psychotics, okay? You have the people like uh, Jeffrey Dahmer and, you know, who are uh, Gacy. You know, these are, these, are, these are people who are, who are not, not right, okay? Uh, so when we discuss how far are you willing to go, uh, you could take another person's life without being psychotic or without being psychiatrically disabled. Okay. You know, it's all about protection. If you can protect yourself or you protect your loved ones, you do what you have to do. Then you have to learn to live with what the outcome was. Okay. I mean, even if you get away legally scot free, how are you mentally processing it? Is this going to affect you? Um, we know that great heroes, real true heroes, like Audie Murphy, struggled with what's now known as PTSD, okay? Um, he 
was, I believe, the most decorated soldier in World War II. Um, it, it, you know, these men had to live with what they encountered uh, the rest of their life. You mentioned Radvan with the concentration camp. Me with the neighborhood, which was a decades, couple decades long uh, uh, combat zone that I was in. Uh, it, it, we have to live with this shit for the rest of our lives. Some people are adjusted, some are, are not. Far better men than me uh, both adjusted and didn't adjust, okay? So I, I don't know what, what I can tell people other than uh, you don't really know what's going to happen. The fight's rarely over when it's quote unquote over, okay? It's stuff that can linger forever. It's like a fire. You put out the fire, but the scent still lasts and on and on and on, okay? And, and, and that's how these these traumatic events can be and and it could even be not nothing violent it could be a divorce or just a breakup with a girlfriend or if you're a woman with the, you know your 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 boyfriend or significant other whatever how how long is what kind of ling what kind of lasting effects does that have so these are things that you have to process going through all this paperwork that i found in my attic i ran across love letters from exes girlfriends and whatever that uh some that I, I mean, were women that I don't even think got to the girlfriend stage. I don't, I don't know. But um, in hindsight, the last three days, I've been reflecting on it. Now, it hasn't altered my life, but I have, I have been reflecting on it for the last three days. We discussed this a little bit yesterday. I was getting compliments from this one lady in the letter. I don't remember who she is. But obviously, we had some sort of relationship because she knew me. and. You know, it made me stop and think, was this, a, was this an opportunity that I blew? I can't answer that because I don't remember who she is, but is this an opportunity that maybe I messed up? Okay, so these are, so, you know, these are things that we, we, we carry along with us um, that you have to process. And the, the, the psychology that I studied, you know, they normally give you tidbits or guidelines. That, you know, six weeks, six months, uh, that you should be mourning or, or, or it takes you this, on average, this long to get over it. If it's taking you longer, you, you have a problem, okay? And, and those, so these are guidelines that I, I try to tell people. If you get into a street fight, if you get into a situation and, and let's say you come out of it relatively physically unscathed, emotionally, may, it may take you a little bit of time to get over. But it shouldn't take super long. If it does, um, you got an issue and, and, you, need, and you, need, you need professional help. You don't need a martial arts instructor at that point. You need a psychologist or, or some sort of counselor to help you get, you know, help you process this. Um, so just like an injury, a broken arm may take six weeks, you know, psychologically, an, an incident may take six weeks or, or six months, but anything longer than that, there, there's an issue um, and that you have to watch out for that. So I guess that's probably a good way to wrap up the show, I, I would assume. Definitely. You, you, you know, you coming into my life, this is something that I... I there's not a psychologist in the world that can help me. I mean, I, they've told me we're not, we're not trained for something like this. I know it can be, it can be devastating, but uh, appreciate you taking one for the team for everybody else, for humanity, I guess, absorbing that, having to process it. So who knows what the future holds, Tony, maybe yeah. there'll be mental health for you down the road. So, <laughs> well, the future holds a seminar next Sunday at the Krav Maga DuPage 10 a.m. to 12 noon. Um, so that's what the, the immediate future holds for sure. Sorry for those that, well, I don't think anybody, this is, if, if, uh, what's his name? Chuck may supposedly put on the, on his website. And I think you mentioned it. You changed our website last night or 
Oh, I forgot to change my website website. Well, yeah, Facebook, the word got out there, though. Okay, yeah, it's just so much for me to deal with. I can't remember. But anyway, I want to thank everybody for signing in and watching and listening. And um, hopefully we'll have a nice guest next week. Uh, let's work on that, Joe. For sure. All right. We'll have to not, you know, remember now next Sunday, I will be doing the pod, uh, the seminar. So we'll have to change the schedule a little bit. No problem. All right, everybody take care. Thanks for watching. Bye. <laughs>